Okay, today we're going to be doing lift, uh, something that's not really touched on, funny enough, uh, all that often. Um, so it's always quite good to refresh it, but if you can understand uh, all the different intricacies of the lift equation, then it help you understand um, actually the aircraft itself and the, the tech behind the aircraft and how it's designed and made. Um, all the usual publications, and there's various ways you can do this, and I'll just show you my take on it. Okay, that's all you need to start with then. So first of all, I've got a blade, and you can see we're looking down from the top on the starboard blade. It's moving in this direction with an airflow impacting up at this point, um, root and the tip. And then up in the top, we've got the lift equation. So the first thing to do is go through the lift equation and just uh, make a note of what each aspect actually means. So the coefficient of lift. What is the coefficient of lift and what makes it up? Well, first of all, the coefficient of lift is um, directly uh, proportional to the angle of attack. And when you look at most uh, or all Aerofoil designs, you'll see in their publication, it will print out based on environmental, set environmental conditions what the coefficient of lift is for each angle of attack. And you can see here we've got the coefficient of lift on the left-hand side and the angle of attack on the bottom and as the coefficient of, or the angle of attack increases, the coefficient of lift goes up as well and therefore will give you a higher lift. And then as we start to get towards those higher angle of attacks where we're starting to experience a bit more turbulent flow on the top surface of the wing and a little bit more separation, that's when we start to see the lift tailing off and the coefficient of lift tailing off slightly. And then when we hit our critical angle of attack, that's when the um, coefficient lift completely drops off and your lift is al altogether gone. So what affects it then? So let's start with um, shape of the aerofoil. So if you look at these two aerofoils, you can see we've got quite a thick, short, fat aerofoil here. Uh, very characteristic of a slow moving aircraft. Essentially we are managing, essentially we are managing with the large thickness of the camber here. We're managing to accelerate the air much much more as it has to move a much further area over the top. Uh, if it has to move further, then therefore it needs to accelerate more. So we get faster air on the top, therefore a higher pressure differential, and therefore we're achieving uh, more lift uh, for a slower speed of air. And likewise here, we've got a thinner airfoil, and therefore even though we're moving very fast, the air isn't going to accelerate uh, very much because it hasn't got a particularly large distance to travel due to the, the slightly thinner aerofoil section here and therefore we can move much much faster and probably generate roughly the same amount of lift as this one. So that's what is talked about by the shape of the wing, wing or shape of the aerofoil and the cross section and by altering that we can alter the amount of lift we produce and that is exactly and it's the shape of the wing which is going to uh, dictate what the coefficient of lift looks like for each given angle of attack. Um, and in this particular example, for, you can see that if we have zero angle of attack on the blade, we're probably actually still going to uh, generate quite a bit of lift because we've got considerable amount of camber on the, on the um, actual um, aerofoil. Zero angle of attack on this particular aerofoil would probably not achieve quite the same level of coefficient of lift. So what's next? or rather tenuously, is the Reynolds number. So why is the Reynolds number effect? This is something that gets banded around quite a bit, and we're just gonna break it down very quickly, but it's not something really for you to worry about, and it's not something you should go into in a huge amount. Uh, the only thing I would suggest you talk about is the Reynolds number is the ratio of uh, inertial forces and viscous forces, and therefore will uh, decide where you're going to get your uh, separation or your uh, your turbulent flow and your laminar flow and therefore separation and therefore your critical angle of attack. But what does the Reynolds number actually mean? Let's have a look. So Reynolds number, as we just said, is the ratio of inertial forces to viscal forces. Viscous forces. What does that mean though? Okay, so essentially in terms of inertial forces, uh, we're looking at momentum. Uh, so if we've got um, something that's quite big and heavy, like a big juggernaut or a big um, oil tanker, something like that, um, 
it's a very big heavy object and in order to stop it it's going to take quite a lot of uh, force to stop it so it's got a very high inertia. So we're looking at how much momentum the airflow has. How does that translate in the actual equation itself? Well, so the initial, uh, the inertial forces are calculated by the density times the velocity times the length, and that's the length of the aerofoil. So again, going back to the analogy of the, the large lorry, um, if we've got uh, a large heavy lorry moving very very fast and it's got a lot of momentum and you can say the same about very thick dense air if it's traveling very very fast then essentially it's got a lot of momentum and it's going to take quite a bit to stop it and if it wants to move over this aerofoil then it probably is going to do just that. So what's countering it? Well it's the viscous forces and in this particular case the equation for it is quite simply the dynamic viscosity. So the dynamic viscosity is in simple terms the stickiness or the resistance to movement of that air. Um, so think of this in terms of um, trying to force honey through a small hole or trying to force water through a small hole. So what does that actually mean then? Well, if we take a molecule at the surface here, which is static, and all airfoils will have um, particles at the surface which are static, if you've got a particularly viscous flow and therefore particularly resistant to movement, then what you'll find is that resistance will transfer through the surrounding uh, air particles um, uh, as, as you move away from the airfoil. So you'll find, as you, even though you're moving further away, you're still going to get resistance to movement further out here. So that's your viscous forces. So how has this actually got anything to do with the uh, coefficient of lift? Well, if you've got this big juggernaut of air that's trying to move over the top of the surface and you've got a relatively low amount of viscosity at the surface due to the, um, the density of the air and the, the characteristics of the air itself, then essentially this air doesn't get slowed down at all, um, but we have a very high um, velocity distribution. So right at the surface here we've got very very slow air and then suddenly all the air above that is very very fast and what that tends to cause is a bit of a, sh a shear force and then the airflow can separate quite quickly. So clearly if this section of the equation is very high, so if you've got very high density, so very heavy fast moving air um, but not very much viscous force then we're going to end up with a high Reynolds number. If we've got a high Reynolds number, this big juggernaut's going to separate quite quickly and give us turbulent flow. Uh, and therefore, we're quite likely to um, hit our critical angle of attack and get full separation earlier than we wanted to. Conversely, if we have quite high viscous forces, then essentially all we've got is uh, more resistance. Uh, which is a more of a transfer of energy um, f between the surface and the free stream air, which means it's going to nice and gently slow that big jug juggernaut down, and uh, we're going to get a more controlled uh, flow over the top of this aerofoil, and therefore probably likely to be more laminar. A resistant to separation, and therefore uh, you're going to maintain your lift for longer. So that's Reynolds number. Next. Surface of the blade, much like cricket, if you know cricket at all, I mean if you've got a rough surface the airflow doesn't flow over it as quickly and therefore you're not going to get the same amount of lift from it. And then if you get a nice smooth surface you're not going to get uh, as much separation so early and you're going to maintain lift for longer. Speed of sound, or more specifically the compressibility, um, the speed of sound or environmental speed of sound will affect uh, how soon you get compressibility. Uh, and if you get compressibility effects in air, then that's going to directly affect uh, 
the flow of the air and also the pressure distribution and therefore um, the amount of lift you're going to achieve. The last one, angle of attack, and it's one we've talked about already, so the direct um, impact on the coefficient of lift. The more angle of attack you have, essentially, the more the, of a pressure distribution you're going to get, uh, and therefore the higher of the coefficient of lift you're going to uh, achieve more lift. So that's the various aspects of coefficient of lift. So next along the equation, we've got half, which is a constant, then we've got rho, which is the density of the air. Okay, again, it's going to be dependent on the environmental conditions of the day, not something we can really affect. V, and importantly, V squared, which is the velocity. Meters per second, generally, we're going to measure that one in. And then the last one is the surface area. So surface area then is quite literally the plan view form of the actual blade. So it's the length times the width, the entire looking down aspect of the uh, blade. That's how much we're looking at calculating. So that's how the lift equation breaks down. Um, but importantly, we need to understand, first of all, the lift distribution in reality on a rotor blade as opposed to an aeroplane, and also what we can do to affect that. So the first thing to note is, um, unlike an aeroplane, uh, this blade is rotating, and we've already discussed the fact that in the uh, route, it's traveling a much shorter distance than it is at the tip, so therefore the relative speed of the blade at the tip is gonna be much higher than the route. So looking at the equation, we can see we're gonna get a much higher lift at the tip than the route, but more importantly, because it's the square of the velocity, we're actually going to get an exponential increase in lift as we get towards the tip. Now, this is not an ideal situation because, as you know, uh, the blade is only fixed uh, at a relatively small mass down at this end. Um, and if we flew around like this all the time, if this was our actual lift distribution, then the blade would probably reflect uh, the lift uh, magnitude itself. So the blade would spend its entire time flexed all the way up like this. That's not efficient for flying, but also it's not very good structurally. So ideally, what we would like to see, uh, much like a, an aeroplane, is a more evenly distributed lift. So in an ideal world, we'd see something more akin to that. So how can we achieve that sort of lift? So how can we affect this lift distribution from the root to the tip? And essentially we want to try and reduce the lift uh, down near the tip and increase it up near the root. So the first thing we come to is the shape of the aerofoil. What can we do? Well, we can give ourselves a slightly thicker camber down towards the root. and a slightly more slender camber uh, down towards the tip. This is a little bit more difficult to see on your uh, helicopter. If you look down the cross section from the tip, you might just about be able to notice a change in thickness, uh, but it's very subtle, uh, but it's something that is quite common on a lot of aircraft. So the next one then is the angle of attack. Now we already know uh, that we can change the angle of attack by using the collective to move the, the pitch up and down, but we can also uh, affect the angle of attack um, and make it different at the tip than it is at the root. And that you get this on an aeroplane as well, um, so we can quite literally uh, twist the blade and that will give at the tip um, a uh, almost feathered blade, so zero pitch, and then at the root, when the collective is at zero pitch, you might actually have a couple of degrees of angle of attack or a couple of degrees of pitch on it. And this is uh, usually known as washout. So None of the rest of these we can really affect. We're not going to adjust the surface uh, friction anywhere and, and change the actual surface material. 
Uh, density of the air and the velocity is not really changeable on a permanent basis. However, the surface area is changeable, and we see this very frequently on aeroplanes, but we can also do it on helicopters. And by quite simply uh, making the cord length a little bit shorter down towards the tip and the uh, root cord a lot longer, you're effectively going to achieve a greater surface area down here uh, than we do down here. And therefore, we're going to create more lift uh, down at the root than we are at the tip. This one's, generally speaking, just going to be called taper. Not to be confused with aspect ratio. Okay, so if we've managed to make one or all of these changes, then we're going to affect uh, or increase the lift down near the root to some extent, and that's going to enable us to have a more favorable lift distribution. And it could look anything towards this sort of thing. So that's pretty much all you really need to cover on lift. So again, if you have any questions, uh, points or queries, any corrections or errors that you've noticed, please let me know in the comments below. Uh, other than that, that's pretty much about it. Cheers.